great to be here. Topic is not so great, but uh, let's see uh, what we can do about it. Uh, I'm an economic historian, as, like Giovanni just told you, and I look at long-term processes. And to me, that is uh, what is fascinating, is how, do, how did we get here? That's my main uh, question. And we're not in a good place. That's uh, pretty obvious. But in my way of thinking, these three states are quite important because the Republicans won these three states by a uh, minute margin. And uh, the fact of the matter is, if that only 40,000 people have changed their votes, the vote would have gone the other way. Okay, so this is known, but it's, this is not well known, but it's crucial because these states voted Democratic since 1988. Okay, so the fact that they're flipped is a big, big thing. And they all voted for Obama. So you, it's difficult to ascribe their change to racism or some other factor. Um, Trump didn't win by much. 30% of the eligible voters, by the way, if you count it that way. It's very far from uh, Rousseau's general will, but that's our system. Okay, so my talk is basically divided into uh, four or five parts. I argue that the economy is not in good shape. You hear all sorts of things. We have a strong economy and all other things, but I'm going to show you that it's really not in good shape. Uh, where did it start? Well, history doesn't have a beginning, but I'm going to start with Reaganomics because it was rather uh, important. A, a big change from the FDR policies, which more or less uh, lingered on into the 70s. And uh, then hyper-globalization clobbered a lot of people. And financial crisis was basically wasted because it would have been an opportunity, like in 1933, to get on a different path. Okay? My thinking is very path dependent, namely that you get on a path and the logic of the momentum takes you in a particular direction. Now, you can always get off of it, it is true, but it is not easy, it's very difficult, and it's not going to happen very frequently. History may provide you with certain opportunities, and that, that opportunity was provided in 2009 with the election of a liberal president who promised change, but did not deliver. Okay, that's my argument. So we got a revolution, a uh, revolution of the deplorables, which is not a nice way of putting it. There are other ways of, of saying that people who were left out or felt left out, and that's where we are. Now, uh, people, people like uh, Marty Feldstein, uh, got up at the uh, 2016 meeting of the American Economic Association and said that we were essentially at full employment and that, you know, the economy's in good shape. And that's why I have this uh, drawing uh, contradicting him because an, an economy in a good shape would not have elected uh, Donald Trump. That is my uh, belief. And I'm going to be showing that there is an accumulation of despair. Okay, so the revolution depends on an acc accumulation of despair within a fairly large segment of the lower classes. Let's put it that way. And that's of despair is one aspect of this. Okay, what do I mean by that? That's of despair. Um, suicides are up, as you know. Opioid epidemics are up. 
alcoholism is up. All this leads to difficulties in, um, in the society. In addition, there are a lot of other signs which, which point in similar direction. Namely, we have mass murders. You know, it used to be the case that when you killed somebody, there was a reason for it. Okay, maybe vengeance or maybe a love affair or something like that, but that is no longer the case. Okay, uh, we're killing people we don't really know. And to me, that's part of the despair because how do you attack the system in today's world? Well, it's not all that easy. easy. Uh, you know, it's much easier to go up in a hotel room in Las Vegas and start shooting. Okay, I, and I think they have not found a reason why that person uh, killed 60 or so people and wounded another 200. There's no real reason for it. And I, my interpretation or my speculation is, is that it's part of the same attack on the system that all, some of the other things are. Our school shootings, the same way, they all point to a kind of fraying of the social contract, okay? Uh, the glue that holds society together. Okay? And I believe that vote for Trump was in these states also motivated by these kinds of factors, namely vengeance. The system treated me badly. I'm going to treat the system. I'm going to show them elites something. I'm going to send them somebody who's going to be able to give them a hard time. Okay, so here's Case and Dayton's work you know, shows that uh, poisonings are up, these are opioids, they're up tremendously. Uh, suicides, <laughs> suicides, chronic liver disease, diseases. This doesn't happen in a good economy, folks. Okay, and it happens at all ages, or practically all ages. And in international comparisons, U.S. whites are most uh, clobbered, so to speak. <clears throat> and you can, you can uh, see how it spreads. This is 2000. These are uh, deaths of despair in 2000, 2007, 2011, 2014. It's like cancer. And my, my model is that people are in despair are more likely to vote for somebody like Donald Trump, okay, as a way of getting back at the system, okay? And Trump won big in areas with high debts of despair, high rates of import penetration, high rates of economic distress. Here's one example. Uh, let's look at min the Midwest. You can, uh, you can divide the counties into lowest and highest mortality counties. And in counties where you had high mortality, Trump won, not only won, but exceeded Romney's numbers by 15%. Okay, so to me, the deaths of despair are a crucial element in this whole process. Here's another example uh, in which uh, you have the national average life expectancy between 1980 and 2014. Okay, it's about five years and uh, 5.3 years. And those counties which did not reach the national average were much more likely to vote for Donald Trump, okay? All these, all these people, 
is here the average in this quadrant. Okay, now a few of them also voted for Hillary, but by a much smaller margin. Okay, so demographics is important. And of course, income is so also. And here you have real, real median household income. Uh, this is 2017, and you see that the increase since 1998 has been about $1,300, which is about $72 per year. Nothing to really brag about. Okay? This is not a strong economy, in other words. Here's Ohio. It's down. It hasn't even reached the 1998 peak. Okay, they don't tell you these numbers. You don't, you don't hear these numbers too frequently. Uh, Wisconsin, down. Michigan, really down. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't be so surprised that these states uh, went for Donald Trump. Okay, so the demographics ain't good. Income ain't good. Unem what about unemployment? You hear? We're full employment, folks. <laughs> Except we ain't. Okay, because the numbers are cooked. And this is the real unemployment rate. Uh, it's close to eight percent for whites, but. Look at minorities, <laughs> Hispanics, uh, over 12%, African Americans over 15%. Okay, not so good. Um, so this, this also hurts. But if you look at it uh, more uh, stratified, People without a high school diploma are really hurting. They're the ones who are hurting. Okay, they're the ones that Donald Trump loves. <coughs> high school diploma, no college. African Americans still 17% unemployed. This is in January of 2018. Back in 2016, it was even higher. Okay, so it's not good by any means. So that's my, this is the first part of my lecture, namely the U.S. economy has generated a lot of despair. Of course, on average, things don't look so bad, but that's not what determines the political process. The political process is also determined to a considerable degree by the dispersion of welfare. Okay, so we're basically in a dual economy. Okay, some people are doing marvelously and other people are uh, really behind the eight ball. And uh, Trump would not have won otherwise. That's my argument. Okay, so it's important. So uh, mine is a kind of uh, analytic uh, narrative in which I use social <laughs> science concepts like pad dependence is very important to me. Across the board tax cuts of Ronald Reagan was where it all began because those are all very, very deceiving. And once you lower taxes on the super rich, it's very difficult to raise it back again because of a ratchet effect because then they, excuse me, more or less feel like they, uh, they deserve it, they claim it, and it's very difficult to raise it back again. And in addition, there's another thing here, relative incomes matter a lot. It's not part of mainframe economics. You can read the principal textbooks and you will not, hear, not be able to read that in. But they do matter a lot because of envy, 
because uh, people see that it's unjust, that the uh, super rich were bailed out in the financial crisis. None of the big shots uh, experience downward so social mobility into my class. Okay, Dick Fold is still a millionaire. Angelo Mozillo is still a millionaire. All these folks, so you know that bothers uh, some people. So relative relative incomes matter. That's important to me. Downward social mobility is very difficult to take. It's one thing to be born poor, like I was born poor, but I didn't know that I was poor because everybody around me was poor, and I thought it was normal. <laughs> It didn't make any difference to me. It's very different for somebody who had a you know, middle class job and then starts working at Lowe's for $12 an hour. A person I met there said he voted for Trump and for vengeful reasons. And that I think I can understand that. The system didn't treat him well. And of course, there came the financial crisis. A lot of people evicted. You think that's fair? While the millionaires are getting their share of uh, federal support? Uh, I don't think so. So injustice also is a motivating factor. And of course, you have stagnant wages at the bottom. Uh, while the rich become super rich. That's not a recipe for a good political system. Okay? And in addition, you have to take into consideration that the Reagan tax cuts uh, create a lot of wealth at the top, and that wealth was, was converted into political power. Okay, uh, so in hindsight, we could say that the government should have maintained the balance of power in the society. That's one of the goals. Should have been one of the goals. We didn't recognize it, but uh, that's important because democracy is predicated on the dispersion of power. And without countervailing plow power, you get plutocracy. And you also get money also not only buys you political power, but it also buys you the means to propagate your ideology, which then becomes the dominant ideology of the free market. Freedom and the free market, and what do you got against that? And then they can hire economists by the busful in order to propagate that principle. So we come to a situation in which the citizens do not recognize their own self-interest anymore. OK. So uh, we, get, we started on a path to Trump and Re by Reagan's time. And you know, all these folks just added to the <coughs> despair. Well, you know, I said it was Reaganomics, globalization, financial crisis, technological unemployment. Let's add that in there, too. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, uh, Reaganomics. Well, across the board, uh, tax cuts create a lot of inequality. Okay, uh, they didn't say that at the time, but um, the marginal tax rate went down from 70% to about uh, 30, 35, I don't, I don't know, you know, in the 30s. Joseph Stiglitz recognizes the problem began with uh, Ronald Reagan. Now here are some numbers that I uh, calculated. It's uh, quite interesting. These are the um, tax brackets in 1985. 
Here are the poor, they're earning $9,000. We go up 11, 13, 22 is typical in those days, okay? And then we get up to the millionaires, okay? Now, the millionaires were paying, play, excuse me, paying 47% taxes, okay? That's the average. You know, the 70% is misleading. That's the marginal tax rate. They're paying 47%. And their tax rate goes down, not by a lot, by 7% to 39%. Uh, seven points, seven points, I should say, which is about a 16-point decline. Notice that the people at the bottom had a higher re uh, percentage decline. The typical is 41%. So that Reagan could go to the public in good conscience and say, you know, this is progressive because we lowered the people at the bottom by more than we did the people at the top. But look at what it does in terms of actual tax savings. Zero. You might as well round that down to zero and buys you a couple of uh, trips to McDonald's. And then you get to the average $1,600. All right, it's a nice number, but it's certainly not a game changer for these folks. Okay, and today's money, uh, $1,600 is $3,500. It's okay, but it's not, not going to be a game changer, you see. Here, however, if you look at the millionaires, they get 175000 bucks. In today's money, that's, a, oh, in today's money, that's almost $400,000. Now, you can do something with that, okay? Uh, obviously, you can't increase your conspicuous consumption anymore because you got everything. But you can certainly buy yourself a few politicians on that. You can certainly buy yourself a few economists on that. So that, to me, is where our problems started because it, it creates an incredible amount of inequality, and these folks can then steer the political process in their direction. We want more deregulation of the economy, okay? Uh, in fact, in this period, only the top quintile, the rich, which I call the rich, uh, grew at anywhere decent rates. The upper middle class grew a little bit, the poor grew a little bit, but the middle class uh, was very, very close to zero, actually. Okay, so this is what is referred to as the hollowing out of the middle class. And if you break down the top quintile into uh, four groups, you see that it's really the top 1% that really benefits. You know, the 96 percentile, well, they're doing okay. The 90th percentile, they're doing okay. But really, the super rich uh, are really growing at, a, at an exceptional rate. Okay, so this was an, this became an economy that well, really served the uh, super rich. And as you can see, their, their income increased by $600,000 in this period. Whereas the lower middle class didn't change. The middle class increased by $1,000 and, and so forth. So this is where all the benefits accrued. 
Uh, part of the problem was the so-called productivity gap, which meant that labor productivity rose, but wages didn't. Okay, and if you notice here, 1980 is uh, kind of a watershed here because under uh, Carter, this gap did not widen. Uh, this is pretty, pretty parallel. The two curves are moving pretty parallel to one another. And it isn't until Reagan comes into power that these uh, graphs just diverge from one another in a big way. And you can also see it in terms of the income shares. This comes from Piketty. Income shares of the top one tenth of one percent. And look at 1980. Their income share has been falling right up to here. And then it just begins to increase in a big way from under 4% to 12% of total national income. Okay, and this is the top one tenth of one percent. This is 125,000 households out of the 125 million households in the country. So <laughs> the economy just about turns on a dime. That's the amazing part about it to me, that it turns on a dime. when uh, hourly wages you know, are, are coming down for no high school, you didn't finish high school, goes down from about 18 to what about 13? Now it's $5 in this period and, and we're just in the 1990s here. You see, high school graduates down, this is ground fermentation for people in despair. Because as I said, downward social mobility is, is a killer. I'm gonna skip a few here. Uh, real GDP per capita was not specifically great under Reagan, but it was you know, still in the uh, two and a quarter, 2.2 percent, pretty decent in, in retrospect. But then we hit 2000, and uh, even if you take out the recession, GDP per, per capita goes down to 1.5, 1.4 percent. So those are some long-term trends. Uh, budget deficits under Reagan begin to bulge. As you see, federal budget deficits are not good. That's one of the legacies of Reagan, that he started the endemic budget deficits. Clinton tried to reverse it for a little bit, but uh, that not very successfully. Uh, as a percentage of GDP, federal debt increased from about 30% to just about 60% by the middle of uh, Bush Sr.'s tenure. Okay, and we're, at, we're going to be adding to it uh, because of the Trump tax cuts too, which is a very silly thing to do, very dangerous thing to do, actually. Okay. Well, he also uh, destroyed the unions, which were, was important for the middle class. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too much, but uh, the unions played a big role, actually, in maintaining the balance of power within the political order. And once you get rid of the unions, there's no countervailing power because the politicians have something that uh, big business wants, namely deregulation, and 
businesses have something that politicians want. So it's a natural quid pro quo exchange. And, and he also advocated anti-statism, mm -hmm. which then develops into you know, kind of hatred for the government, uh, which is also quite uh, counterproductive. <laughs> he also did a lot for deregulation of the economy. Minimum wage declined by 30% under his tenure, for example. <clears throat> of course, rugged individualism sounds good, but it really um, favors those with power. Okay? It's not really democratic. So, conclusion of part two is that um, uh, 1981 was a watershed and path-dependent processes carried it forward, including hyper-globalization, which destroyed America's industrial heartland. The Russians wanted to destroy it, couldn't the Chinese figured out a way to do it, okay? They outsmarted us in a big way, created a Rust Belt, and economists were cheerleaders of both NAFTA and trade with China, okay? Without any caveats. They, were, they didn't add any caveats. Hey, watch out for the folks who lose. You didn't hear things like that. And so manufacturing go, went down in that period, but nothing took its place because finance uh, wasn't higher. You know, fi finance was booming, uh, but they weren't hiring those people who were fired from the textile factory. Maybe a few janitors and such, but uh, not in large numbers, okay? So the way economics is thought, it, it is taught in such a way that trade is good, comparative advantage, right? America benefits. Okay, but who in America benefits and who loses and what are the political consequences of that? The social, social and political consequences of that? Well, those are not the, the purview of economists, we'll let other people deal with that, you know, politicians can deal with that and so forth. But uh, foreign trade caused a lot of unemployment, a lot of misery actually. Uh, it may be that uh, the losses to society are bigger than the so so uh, supposed benefits, okay? Uh, because unemployment is usually not part of the uh, mainstream models. Well, you can see from this equation, GNP goes down if imports uh, exceed exports. So import, uh, a, a negative balance weighs on the economy and creates problems, and that's exactly what happened under Reagan, and then under Clinton, uh, our trade balance just increased by a lot, and then China comes in and, and creates havoc, okay? Cumulative balance is about $15 trillion, and of course, that's a great stimulus to the rest of the world's economy. Uh, so you got to think about the distribution of uh, gains and losses. I'm going to go through this uh, a little bit. Danny Roderick of the Kennedy School has been the only one who kind of uh, came out and said, well, we made some mistakes here, folks. Uh, he wrote an article titled, Our Economists Partly Responsible for Donald Trump Shocking Victory in the U.S. Presidential Election, and the answer is yes. Okay, David Alter um, wrote an article uh, saying that um, a rising trade 
is to a considerable degree responsible for the presidential election because those areas that were hit hard by the Chinese trade were more likely to vote for Donald Trump. So uh, their conclusion is that Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina would have elected the Democrat instead of the Republican candidate in 2016 if the growth in Chinese import penetration had been 50% lower than the actual growth. Okay, so that's kind of an important study. Trade also kills those people, those areas that were hit hard by imports uh, also had a higher suicide rate. So that's hyperglobalization. And as I said, 2008 would have been a possibility for us to kind of rear away from that path that Ronald Reagan forged in 1981, okay? But the opportunity was missed. And it would have been a possibility because the rich and powerful were on their knees. They were bankrupt. That's the only time where you can really, where you could have really put the economy on a different path. Okay, but um, it wasn't the case. Uh, the bailout was the biggest transfer of wealth from the bottom to the elite in the history of mankind. Okay? There's nothing comparable. The pyramids, uh, there's nothing like that. Uh, this, this guy is one of the culprits, uh, Timothy Geithner. Uh, he was in charge of the New York Fed during the uh, crisis uh, or the pre-crisis years and Obama made the biggest mistake of his life by putting him in charge of the treasury because he fought tooth and nail for the banking system, cared nothing about the people on Main Street, absolutely nothing. And it's a terrible, terrible person. He's making big money now working for a um, hedge fund probably makes more money than all of us put together in 10 years or so. Um, uh, and of course, Obama put him there. Obama listened to him, okay? So yeah, Obama is not blameless by any means. Uh, Geithner claims that it was absolutely necessary to transfer the trillions to the bankers in order to avoid falling off the cliff. That's what he you know, kept on saying, we got to avoid falling off the cliff. Well, yeah, but there are different ways and, you know, never mentioned that there were other ways of avoiding falling off the cliff. And you didn't, you had to bail out the banks, but you didn't have to bail out the bankers. And you could have also bailed out Main Street. Okay, but there's no, no real thinking about it. And nobody really thought about the political consequences of that. So that's where you get the accumulation of despair from Reagan to Clinton to uh, Obama. Okay? And inequality is worse now than it was uh, before the crisis. Eight million evicted. You know, they can't be uh, feeling uh, very happy about the system. And it was basically an unjust policy, let's face it. And of course, some people say, well, uh, they paid back all that money. They paid it back. But uh, they also made a lot of money on that, on the bailouts. Uh, I just picked two banks here, which in March of 2009 were worth $24 billion. Okay. Now, uh, they didn't get the downside. They didn't have to, pay, you know, they didn't get the downside, but they got all the upside. By uh, January of 2019, they were $400 billion. The taxpayer didn't get a penny of that. Who would consider that a just policy? Okay. So there were a lot of problems with the way uh, 
you know, the bailout was um, handled. There is one study, uh, hidden, hidden study uh, by the Boston Fed that said, let's bail out the distressed homeowner. That's the only study that I know of. But I talked to the author and he said, well, I sent it to Larry Summers. Uh, Larry Summers doesn't remember getting it. Okay. So what can I tell? I won't get it going to the uh, yeah. conclusion. Uh, we're in bad shape, folks. We're in much worse shape than we think we are because the, all these problems are not even recognized, okay? Uh, we have basically 18 structural problems, uh, like the budget deficit, large private debt, foreign trade imbalance, endemic unemployment, obscene level of inequality, excuse me, political gridlock, costly military, military engagements around the globe. We can't get out of those either. Stagnating income, stagnating wages, you know, it's not going to, that's not going to change anytime soon. We're in a new historical epoch. It's very hard to recognize for people, very hard to acknowledge and contemplate that we're, you know, it's a turning point. We, got, we need to new thinking, new ways of thinking about all this. Um, we have we morphed into an era of slow growth that will continue. Economic theory is inadequate for the task because economic theory is not interdisciplinary. It doesn't consider the social and political issues at hand. And we have uh, an unbalanced economy. The financial sector is like a cocoon. It's making money like crazy, but it's decoupled from the real economy. It's not really helping uh, people on mainstream. And of course, GNP is decoupled from employment and will become more so in the near future. And we have skill mismatch. And here's where education is really uh, problematic because it's very costly, as we all know, inadequate uh, for the tasks at hand. Uh, too many mediocre schools around and no real plan even to think about fixing it. Uh, productivity slowed down, innovation has run out of steam. Uh, inefficient healthcare system, which takes a lot of uh, a lot of our uh, funds. Uh, so, do not blame the, the deplorables for heaven's sake. They're the victims. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, at least, uh, it's not their fault that they were excluded. It's not they did not create the system. Okay, uh, they do not understand the system and they are being manipulated in a big way. So my argument is that it is the economic policies that led to the revolt of the deplorables and to the vengeance on us. I see that I'm running out of time and here's where we are. Thank you for your attention. Hi. I'm going to be a little bit mischievous, and I'm going to say it sounds maybe just a little bit that you have some sympathy for Trump's um, uh, confrontation and hostility about the Chinese trade relationship with the U.S., if not maybe the man and the, and the approach. Yeah, the approach is, is uh, not very uh, promising. But what I'm arguing is that 
we went into hyper-globalization without really thinking mm -hmm. through the consequences, and we should have done that. Right. But once we are here, you know, it's, you can't go back. You right. can't recreate those factories. And, uh, you know, that's a pipe dream to bring those jobs yeah. back. So I have sympathy for the idea that we got a problem. Right. But uh, uh, levying tariffs are not going to help us. We should have helped those people who were displaced and clobbered in the 1980s and 1990s. Yeah. Or we could have slowed down the rate of of uh, globalization. That's another uh, concept. So in a sense, you're saying that if you look, you know, retrospectively, we could have um, entered that re trade relationship with China at a different rate with more checks and balances in exactly, place. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, you, you know, these are not reversible processes. Right, right, right. That's the only problem. Very good, thank you. Um, you talk, You wanted to focus on the those three states, but I just um, heard interviews from farmers in Iowa and coal miners in West Virginia who, um, in spite of Trump's policies that have hurt them, are still loyal to him and uh, would not change their vote um, n next election. And so my question is, it's, it's fine to look at all this and all the things we coulda, shoulda, you mm -hmm. know, had we had our, had you back then giving this lecture to everybody. But what do we, what do, we do now about these people who, in my opinion, are our biggest failure, um, with all due respect, has been the failure of our education system, educational system, where people are growing up not learning how these policies that they're voting for are hurting them and not getting an education to look behind um, platitudes and sound bites that they might get on Fox News to tell them how they should vote and what well, they should think. Well, sure, education is one of our uh, biggest of the uh, 18 problems that I had on the board, uh, but uh, we do not have um, any plan, and it's, it would be very, very difficult. So what's your current suggestion? You can't change it. You can't change it. My, my belief is that, uh, you know, it's like, it's like a system. It's going to continue, you know, maybe like the Roman Empire for 500 years and then collapse. You know, it keeps... I personally am not smart enough to, to figure out how to maneuver uh, out, out of this situation. I, I, I don't, sorry, but you know, I wish I could have some. We have 18 problems, or you can't even start on any of them, because we just had a tax cut that takes away a lot of the money that could have been used for education, for example, if we had recognized that education was a big problem. Uh, thank you. Your modesty with respect to solving the problem is refreshing <laughs> compared to what we see in the, in the White House these days. Um, you mentioned that you thought that economic theory is inadequate to the crisis. I'm wondering if you think there is an alternative theory or do you think economics needs to be more open to, to other disciplines? And as, and as an aside, um, does your old one of your alma maters, University of Chicago's economics department, take more than its share of the blame, do you think, for the mm -hmm. situation that we're in? Well, I, I, I do have an economic plan, which, which I just wrote. You can have one of these flyers. Um, I, I do think that at least we could do, we academics, the least we could do is, is try to reform economics so that it's more inclusive of other disciplines. And that's what I'm working on, actually, as, as trying to change things a little tiny bit. But um, 
yeah, the, the, the University of Chicago's economics department was big in propagating the idea of free markets without taking into consideration all the problems with free markets. When you look at information flows, for example, education, economics, economics begins with adults. You know, if you open up the textbook, there's no children in there. But it takes 20 years to become an adult, and then during those 20 years, a lot of things happen to the individual that should be taken into consideration in terms of how the mind is formed, how the tastes and education and all that. So I'm afraid that economics is uh, back in the 18th century. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a problem. So I have a, a quick comment and then a question. John is, and I live in the same neighborhood, and the day after the election, I, we were both out for a walk and ran into each other. The election, when uh, Trump was elected, 2016, and I said to John, boy, this is pretty bleak, what do you think? And he said, this is the way empires come to an end. Yeah. So he's consistent in his pessimism. <laughs> my question has- I studied to, history. <laughs> my, my question has to do with how you see race figuring into this, because- Race? Race. Race. Because African Americans and Hispanics who do have high rates of unemployment, high rates of deaths from despair, did not vote in large numbers, at least. Maybe the Hispanic community, I think, somewhat more ambiguous. But the African American community certainly did not vote for Trump. And those states that did vote for Trump are also uh, have high... Uh, a high prevalence of racism and it's based on internet searches, that kind of data. So for example, West Virginia, where they were overwhelmingly in favor of Trump. So you've got this connection between, uh, I, well, I just wonder how you see race figuring into race this. Race playing into where race, yeah. racism is, is in the background, but uh, obviously, uh, I wasn't concerned the way Mississippi and Alabama is going to uh, go in this election. You know, I, I'm more or less focused on the Rust Belt states, where I, I just don't think that racism plays such a big, uh, big role. Uh, I believe that uh, also downward social mobility is important in my thinking. Okay, and the minorities did not experience downward social mobility because they've always been at the bottom of the totem pole, more or less. And in fact, lately, they've experienced some upward, mo upward social mobility. It's different with uh, white high school dropouts of the 1980s, you know, who got a union job and you know, live pretty decent to lower middle class life, and then all of a sudden the rug is pulled out under him. That's a uh, socially and politically a very dangerous situation. Uh, you identify vengeance as a primary motivator for- As a. A, okay. Um, I was just wondering how you view an alternative or alternative narratives or motivators behind voters that say voted for Obama, uh, but then switch their vote to Trump in 2016. Um, how you see the differences play out between vengeance as a motivator versus you know hope for Trump to somehow alter the system. Well, I personally see Obama as a revolutionary candidate back then for America to elect a partly African-American uh, political leader was to me a revolutionary event, okay? And it's similar a little bit to, uh, to Sarah Palin's uh, um, Sarah Palin's successes among 
certain groups of, popula of the population. You know, she was really, uh, really looked right, a pre-Trumpian, I would say. Sarah Palin as a pre-Trump precursor to Trump. Okay, so there were already back in 2008 signs that the number of deplorables were reaching a a uh, a uh, critical level. Okay. And uh, a lot of people voted for Obama as, as, as a kind of revolutionary, wanting to change the system. What is revolution? Wanting to change the system. And I think he let us down. That's, that's, my, take, that's my take on it. <laughs>